title of my talk is specifically on uh, the environmental consequences of prohibition. What I'm also referring to is legalization with prohibition. And these are going to be lessons from California. Um, as I said, I'm from HSU. I'm also a, a founding faculty member of the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research. It's the first research institute that was created in California to study social, environmental, and economic dimensions of, uh, of cannabis, um, kind of like this institute here um, in Colorado. Um, I'm also a, a policy researcher at the Center for Cannabis and Social Policy out of uh, Washington State. Uh, the executive director, Donna McCorva, founded that a few years back. Um, and I'm an environmental sociologist. Um, some, and I just want to point to some of the recent work that I've been doing uh, with some colleagues at the Institute. Uh, we've been looking at uh, manufacturers of medical cannabis, um, and we've uh, put together an uh, impact assessment on um, sort of uh, manufacturers in the medical. So the, there's two pieces there. And also, uh, I've um, released a couple chapters in this book. It's right here, where there's smoke, and it focuses on the environmental science, policy, and politics of cannabis in the United States. Um, my chapter focused specifically on cannabis agriculture in California, um, and other chapters focus on the environmental policy dimension. So that's been released just recently. Uh, as I said, I'm an environmental sociologist. I did not uh, begin my academic training to start studying cannabis in the environment. Uh, my, my focus was primarily on uh, forest issues uh, around industrial logging. Um, so uh, I ended up attending Humboldt State University in 94 um, and uh, as a graduate student. And as all poor graduate students um, in Humboldt County in the 90s, uh, you know, got embedded in the cannabis industry. So that was part of the way that we all made it through back then, um, working in different indoor and outdoor operations. So I got intimately familiar with the industry. Uh, I went up to Oregon, finished up my PhD work, and when I came back, uh, I got hired at HSU. Um, I went to visit my friends in the hills, and, and what I saw was shocking. Um, the industry had transformed from, uh, you know, a, a sort of a mom and pop, small scale, under the sort of grid industry to industrial agriculture. And I began um, sort of seeing both indoor and outdoor some of the environmental and human health impacts. Uh, folks using the nastiest chemicals doing in indoor production um, at all stages of the plant. Uh, outdoor, uh, we saw basically conversion of former timberlands into um, cannabis plantations. We had illegal roads, we had stream diversions. Uh, so I began asking questions and asking around agency folks, you know, what sort of uh, data have they been collecting on this stuff? And what I found in early 2000 is that no one was collecting any data on the environmental impacts of this industry. Uh, as I said, I was focused on sort of forest industry. Um, where there's sort of lots of data over the years collected on that. Um, and with that knowledge, I went to start to uh, sort of collect that data, trying to figure out what are those indoor and outdoor impacts. And working with an environmental organization um, and some student researchers, we put together this Google Earth video that looked at just a corner of Humboldt County and trying to understand the sort of cumulative impact of environmental cumulative environmental impact of uh, cannabis agriculture in the county. The red dots you'll see are um, locations that we've identified as industrial size grows. And what does industrial size grow mean? Uh, 100 plus plants and multiple greenhouses. Um, so what we did is we took a look at some of, uh, some of these sites. And this was sort of the first iteration of this project. Um, and again, there was this uh, belief in the county that, you know, we are, a, we are a county with a long history of environmental activism. So there was this belief that there were only a few bad actors out there that were doing illegal um, uh, road construction and logging and such. Um, 
so what this video sort of sort of illustrated is that this impact is a lot more than just a few bad actors. Um, and what we were able to identify here is, uh, and this is private lands, I'm not talking about public land, trust best grows, um, hundreds at the time, hundreds in just a small section of, of the county of these industrial sized grows. And what that means for ecosystems, of course, I mean, this is land that has been, you know, run over by industrial logging for over a generation. And it was just in recovery, right? Just in recovery. And so you have this ecosystem in recovery with organizations working for decades to sort of stop timber mining and industrial agriculture. Um, just as this area is in recovery, we have another industry come in and it's unregulated. And these folks are drawing water, as you'll see up here. I mean, there's no water up here. They're pulling it from the creeks and streams. So what we saw is this cumulative impact, uh, salmon streams being dewatered. We saw runoff into the rivers. And this is 2012. Um, and you'll notice this is in, these are in just one watershed. There's dozens and dozens of large-scale industrial grows here. Uh, so this was the first real attempt to understand this issue. Prior to this, there was no one really focusing on this, and this is 2012. And I, it's sad to say right now, it's 2018, and this is not any better. It's actually worse in this area. So, so um, we put this together, and you know, the narrative at the time was, you know, I have all these bad growers. Uh, and we have to sort of police these growers. And as a sociologist sort of studying this topic, um, I started to question that narrative a bit uh, and started to point to other reasons why we see this. So what we started to collect is data on habitat. Uh, so these are some of the environmental impacts. As I said earlier, habitat destruction, we have illegal deforestation, road construction, grading. Uh, we also have uh, you know, folks collecting data now on pesticides and fungicides. There are two critters, the Humboldt Martin and the Pacific Fisher, are threatened because of outdoor grows on private and public lands. There is a researcher, Murad Gabriel, who's doing some amazing research on the impacts on critters and the bioaccumulation of, of uh, second generation animal rodenticides. Growers are basically lining their crops with uh, you know the second generation rodenticide creating chemical fences to prevent critters from going in and we're getting secondary effects here and the bioaccumulation is affecting martins fishers spotted owls we also have water and soil pollution as i've mentioned nutrient loading and waterways and diesel spills um, and you know damming of dewatering of streams as well as the sort of carbon footprint so as I was mentioning, you know, the, the sort of narrative of growers are bad, cannabis is bad environmentally, um, really questioning that narrative and, um, and uh, focusing more of my analysis on the effects of prohibition, right? I see this as not so much bad actors, but as a result of bad policy. And I put this here, this is sort of the newest data that I've been able to collect. This is Cannabis Pro production in 2006 from Sumner and Matthews. Just to highlight the impact of this industry um, on ecosystems, we're looking at around 8 million pounds are grown of outdoor in California with the largest percentage coming in the North Coast where I live, 4 million pounds. And when we're thinking about how much is produced in California, and how much is on the sort of unregulated market, we have about 5%, and this was numbers in 2016, that is actually in the regulated market. So you're looking at 95%, and this is a conservative number. Other numbers say 1% of production. So you're looking at around 15 million pounds that are where it's going on the unregulated market. So, and that's in 2016. It's increased this year. So what that means in terms of the implications for ecosystems when you're having this volume is that, uh, you know, water's got to come from somewhere, right? The runoff's got to go somewhere. Electricity's got to go somewhere. So um, trying to make some sense of these environmental impacts. So what I try to do in terms of making sense of this is, I, you know, what I connect these environmental problems to is this sort of drug policy, right? The unintended consequences of cannabis prohibition. Uh, and I think it's instructive to sort of understand the, the 
the history of the cannabis industry, especially in California, and how it has shaped the practices, the agricultural practices of growers, cultivators. So what I've done is I've broken down into four policy regimes, and I want to talk a little bit about these policy regimes to give you an understanding of how drug policy and how it's been enforced then creates conditions in which we have uh, sort of bad environmental practices in, uh, in cannabis. So, you know, the first regime here talk about industry emergence in the 70s to the 80s. And as we know, um, most of the cannabis from the 60s and the 70s was coming from Mexico, very low quality. Uh, we have uh, administration come in as there was, you know, Nixon in, in the 1970s. Um, you know, he's fighting the countercultural revolution. He's also fighting the, the sort of anti-war movement. He institutes the drug war in 1971. Um, the DEA also created in 73. And what we have here is we have uh, this sort of attempt to limit the cannabis coming into the United States. So we have interdiction efforts all throughout the border. And uh, the result, of course, is we see a little bit of a cottage industry start to emerge in California. The other piece that's important to recognize in terms of the federal government's attempts to, to to uh, eliminate cannabis is we have the creation of the Paraquat program. Folks, and many folks have over, over 40 heard of this, right? So we have Nixon working with the Mexican uh, government to create uh, a program that sprays herbicide all over cannabis fields. So this is the first real uh, indication of which the, the drug war affecting sort of cannabis and, and cannabis in the environment, right? So what happens in the United States is we have this sort of stimulated national um, industry. So we, it's almost, folks have, have considered this like farm aid to California growers, right? Because nobody wanted to smoke Paraquat pot. There were protests um, in D.C. Uh, sort of legalization groups were out there trying to sort of uh, you know, change, the, change this program. We also had the U.S. government actually um, publicize the fact they were spraying pa Paraquat. They had, a, they had a PR campaign saying there's Paraquat in your weed, don't smoke it. So we have, in a way, within, within, within a, a national market, we have pot smokers wanting Paraquat-free pot. So, so we see this sort of emerge, a cottage, cottage industry emerges in California. We have folks coming back from Vietnam. We also have the back to the landers. There's a lot of factors that um, helped to create this, this sort of small industry in California. In terms of environmental impacts at this time, we see very few environmental impacts happen as a result of cannabis agriculture, of this illicit cannabis agriculture. It's not until well, the militarization of eradication that we see uh, an increase in, in environmental impacts. And this was during the Reagan era. Um, we see 1983, a program called CAMP, the Campaign Against Marijuana Plantation Planning, that begins in California where it's a joint effort, state, local, county, and federal to eradicate cannabis farms. They were flying helicopters all over Northern California, Black Hawk helicopters, um, and trying to uh, eradicate what they could see from the sky. It basically, a, it was a terror, terrorizing Northern California. So, so you have this militarization um, take place. You also have some legislative stuff going on with the Comprehensive Crime Control Act of 84, which uh, opened up man mandatory minimums for, uh, for drug crimes, as well as harsher criminal sentencing. You also have this piece with asset forfeiture um, emerge in, in this era. And what that ended up doing is push the cannabis industry, the cannabis cultivators, into um, public lands. Right? You don't want to have your land taken, so what do you do? You grow on public lands. And I've talked to a, folks, a few folks here in Colorado, and, and they say in this region we're seeing that take place. Uh, um, we're seeing sort of outdoor growers not wanting to be policed, and then they're growing on public land. So, this began in the 1980s, so we see this movement towards going on to public lands as a result of drug interdiction efforts, camp in particular. Um, we see increased military surveillance, and this surveillance not only pushes people into public lands, but it pushes people indoors. 
So now we see the rise of indoor agriculture in the hills, where we refer to as a diesel doping. You know, they'll bring a huge industrial generator onto their property, and what will happen is they'll, they'll grow harvest after harvest, hidden because it's a structure, and you can't really get a search warrant. You know, again, the search warrant process at that time is if they didn't see the green plants, they weren't getting a search warrant. So it looks like a structure, choppers fly through. So you see this um, happen in, in 1980s to, to up to 215. Um, and again, what I'm trying to sort of create that link is that link between prohibitionist drug policies and the impacts on the environment. Uh, here's just a shot. This is a generator. You can let your neighborhood. These are these sort of outdoor, outdoor, indoor, off the grid scenes. Um, this is a generator in an underground storage bunker, 500 gallons each of diesel, red diesel, so they get in the ag price. So, I mean, we get into the political economy and another conversation, like who fills these things up up in the hills, you know, the petroleum companies. So, um, this is, this is, uh, these are two that are uncovered. Uh, we had a spill in Hacker Creek where 500 gallons of, uh, of ag diesel spilled into, their, into the waterway, which is, which is uh, you know, drinking source for, for communities. So this is, these are the sort of impacts. And, and again, it's the industry attempting to hide from aerial surveillance. That is, leads us to another sort of unintended consequence. We see now in 1996, we see the gray market emerge with the passage of 215 in California, um, the Compassionate Use Act. Uh, this gave folks sort of a legal, you know, um, sort of get out of jail free card, if you will. Um, so what we see here is industrial cannabis agriculture becoming normalized. Prior to that, as I said, you have the mom and pop, you have sort of small scale family farms, and you see here at this era, you see the, the green wash, rush, referred to as the second green rush, both indoor and outdoor agriculture um, take off. So what, what was you know, maybe a, a hundred plant grow Prior to this, you're seeing the emergence of, you know, thousands of plants on private land, not public land. We're talking private. Uh, at the same time, with the gray market, we see sort of legislative attempts, and, and from D.C., the feds, you know, Bush coming out attacking physicians, right, arguing that, you know, threatening them to take away their license. And I don't know if folks remember in the '90s, you know, when this first came out, California being the first. Um, the threats to physicians who were writing scripts for medical patients. They were sending letters to gardens, supply stores. You have cannabis businesses that were created, medical cannabis businesses getting these letters by the feds. What that does to the industry, of course, then, is again, it, it, again, it promotes, it promotes uh, a, a, you know, a, a practice that avoids regulation. So even though California is trying to get folks regulated in the medical market, we get, we get this pushback from the feds. Another piece, the schizophrenic policy of the feds, we have under the Obama administration, we have uh, Obama killing uh, what was at the time one of the best um, programs in, in, in California in terms of best management practices for cannabis cultivation, and that's the Mendocino uh, zip tie program, the 9.31 program. Um, what that did was uh, try to bring in cannabis cultivators into compliance, into environmental compliance, pesticide, pesticide compliance, and to have um, you know, uh, some control over, 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 the, over the, that expansion. Uh, the first year, the, no one really signed up for the program, but the second year, you had many cultivators sign up. It was bringing in almost a million dollars um, to the county, uh, and there was hope that this program could be reproduced. Uh, um, people were then trusting that the feds would not come and police them. Uh, the, the first year of the program, um, growers were not in, in getting signed up because they felt that the county would give their information to the feds. And at the, at the start of the second year, the county said, we're not going to release that information to the feds. So people be, you know, believed the county and then submitted their information. The feds then, what do they do? They threaten the county. They threaten to put politicians in jail. And what did the politicians do, of course? Sure, we'll give you it. Too. So what that did was, you know, you have the attempt, and I'm not saying it was the best program that we, sh we should have that now, but it was a program in which tried to bring cultivators into regulatory compliance around pesticides, around plant count, and all of these things, environmental issues that are really important. 
and the feds, they crushed it. Um, again, encouraging people to, to continue to operate under their bad, 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 bad practices. Uh, we have 2012, we have Colorado and Washington, as you know, pass. Uh, what that, I missed that, stimulated, what that did was it stimulated more production in California. Every time an initiative comes on the ballot in any state in the United States, California production ramps up because everybody at the time feels like this is the last run and we're not going to make any money. So at every moment in which we have any piece proposed that's on a ballot, we see environmental impacts increase. We see more trucks hauling soil, we see more water being taken. So there's a direct sort of association between sort of federal prohibition again and environmental problems that we're dealing with in California. Um, the logic of prohibition also, there's another piece there is a sort of we need to, you know, cannabis is bad because we have Mexican cartels in the, in the woods. Um, this is something that really emerged in the 1990s. Um, and not to say that, that, that there are not these drug trafficking organizations in California now, but in 2012, Tommy Lanier, the drug czar for, for, uh, um, for Bush, came out and openly said that there is no evidence at all of drug cartels in our public lands. This is 2012. Um, wiretaps, investigations. So that logic didn't really work for the feds. And the new logic started to emerge in 2012. And that new logic is cannabis is bad for the environment. So the, the, the newest regime, we have legalization with prohibition. And what we see here in California, or here, there in California, is you know, the market is basically closed for most cultivators still today. There are so many barriers, even with the passage of Prop 64, um, to folks coming into compliance. And, and, and that's just generally the permit process, right? The, the fees that are charged for folks to get into compliance, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars just to get into the market, right? Um, on top of that, because of the nature of cannabis, uh, the, how the cannabis industry emerged in California, right? In the hills, far away from everything, really remote, bad roads, right? I mean, tiny roads getting water maybe in places they shouldn't get water. You have stru structures that were built uh, 30 years ago that weren't permitted, right? So now when they want to get permits, the county comes out and like, oh, that house isn't permitted. That road isn't big enough. So now these restrictions on, not restrictions, but these barriers, which restrict their ability to actually come into compliance because the permit process is so onerous. Uh, not to say that they couldn't, shouldn't come into compliance, but these are barriers that are real, especially for folks that have been in this industry for, you know, uh, for many years. We have cannabis banned in 70% of California, right? So 30% of the state is where we're growing weed or are allowed to grow weed. And part of that is back to that sort of cannabis is bad for the environment logic. Um, it's, it's, fuels, as I say, another sort of reefer madness that drives these ineffective drug war policies. So, so in 70% of California, you can't grow it. Are people going to not grow it? You know, the history of prohibition shows that the threats during the Bush and Reagan era and Nixon era didn't really prevent people from growing it in our communities. They're not going to stop growing it. So, so this is another problem with legalization, with prohibition. Uh, what's interesting in our county is they tax grows basically on the maximum amount of uh, size of, that you have permitted for, but they tax them before they even harvest, right? I don't know any other agricultural commodity that's taxed prior to harvest. So if thinking of barriers to legal entry, this is one that is, you know, mm, huge. Uh, as I said earlier, the legal production in California, and these are a couple different numbers, CGA, California Growers Association, you have 1% is in the legal market. Folks have said about 10% two of the cannabis gets into legal production. So that's the range. That, um, and then I think, you know, what's important to understand now with prohibition in California, legalization with prohibition, is that, that we're seeing cannocrats and big canna lobby groups really putting pressure to um, change Proposition 64 and alter the will of the people. Uh, one of the things that just happened, well, happened even before Prop 64 was instituted, is that, that the state decided to lift the limits on um, size in terms of cultivation. 
there was a cap on, um, not a cap, but there's a limit there was on, on the amount of space that one can grow. Uh, and what took place prior is that they limited that, that they found a loophole where they're allowing the stacking of licenses. So you can buy multiple licenses, which then is basically, you know, opens it up to unlimited size. So this is a real threat to, to our community. And what this means in the context of environmental issues, right, is that, you know, this year and next year with the fear of, of opening it up to big business and massive growth, right, is people, they need to pay their mortgage. And what are they going to do? They're going to then do what they can to increase production. And that means inputs. You need water. You need fertilizer. You need space. So that, you need electricity. So you have this sort of movement towards, you know, go as big as you can right now because, you know, they may catch us, but we need to make this, make this happen. So these are real problems with, with you know, legalization with prohibition as it, as it stands. You know, we don't really have legalization, and my, my good friend and colleague, Dominic Corva, is, is uh, someone who talks a lot about this in policy. We have legalization with prohibition. And as we've seen, prohibition, prohibition is policies don't work and they continue to exacerbate environmental problems in Northern California. Continue, right? Um, drug policy is rewarding these poor practices, right? Um, and as, as uh, I've posted here, you know, it, it fuels, as, as my friend Dominic Corva talks about, moral panics that drive these drug war policies. And those moral panics, right, are there's a pot grower next to me and I'm gonna get robbed, or the smell is, needs to be regulated, Right, um, and, and, the, and the concerns around crime increases. So as these environmental impacts um, are increasing, right, the unregulated market continues to expand, right, continues to dominate California. And I said less than 1% have come into the legal market, and that's from CGA's numbers. So federal prohibition really needs to be recognized as both a price support that stimulates the black market and also as something that stimulates environmental damage, right? And not to just focus on, on cannabis is bad for the environment. We have to look at policy as bad for the environment. Again, as I said, in 2012, no one was doing any research on any sort of environmental impact. Uh, uh, law enforcement was going in and just hacking it and pulling it. They're counting plants, that's it. And they were leaving everything. They were literally leaving everything. Right? It wasn't until people started to, well, there's two, two explanations. It wasn't until law enforcement started to lose money for eradication that they moved and switched to, oh, there's environmental problems. And now you have law enforcement doing sort of these educational workshops on environmental issues, which is, as someone involved in the forest defense movement for many years, it's really like the sheriff is talking about, you know, there's an expert on environment, right? We have all these other industries out there doing stuff too, and they're not even... They're not even on their radar. We have to talk to regulators and like, where is this? And work with community groups like the California Growers Association and other, other sort of grower cooperatives that are you know, connected to the people on the ground. Like what can, what's possible?